Hey, welcome back, Chem Guys. Uh, we uh, we just finished up a lab today that uh, dealt with those those micro pumps and got to learn something kind of interesting. So we know just from back in our past, you know, although it wasn't fourteen one and fourteen two, which is always a good thing to review. Technically, that's our present to them. Yeah. So it's our past and our present. We did these little <laughs> heating curves where we had temperature. This is just sort of time, I guess, as we heat something up. And this was zero degrees Celsius and 100. And we could identify where the different phase changes happen. And we thought that uh, that this was the temperature, that this was the heating curve for water, that, that 100 degrees Celsius was the temperature at which water boiled. We found out today it that's not true didn't. all the time. So suddenly you guys, I don't know, you measured the temperature of water. It was kind of warm. I'll put it there. Sure, like there, 60-ish. Exactly. And that was where the water was boiling. So all of a sudden we had a plateau there. The, where did it go? Well, don't worry, hang on. We're going to repair that for <laughs> a moment. Yeah, that. There we go. <laughs> and that was like a new heating curve for water. Well, what if we had, I don't know, say, changed the pressure in that micro pump even more? We probably could have gotten water to boil that was like 40 degrees Celsius, right? Ooh, and what if we kept going? What if we kept changing the pressure more and more and more? We got it to boil at, <gasps> wait a minute, I don't think it'd be boiling anymore. But what if we just totally eliminated the liquid phase altogether? You can do that, because down here, below zero degrees Celsius, we know that water exists in a solid state. And if we have this plateau, we know there's a phase change going on. I guess at the end of this, we would be ending with the gas state. That would be awesome. Wild. What's that called, Mrs. May? <gasps> Where you go from a solid, right, to a lick, I mean to a gas? Yeah. That's called sublimation. Cool science word. Love it. But here's the thing, with this heating curve, I'm going to erase these all for a moment, because <laughs> this heating curve is water at one atmosphere pressure. Mm. And so we really can't just add these other things on. So we need a way to account for differences in pressures and differences in temperatures and the ways that those will affect the different states of matter, I suppose. So we need a new graph. Mm. Let's do it. Cool. What do we call this kind of a graph? A phase diagram. So a phase diagram for water. See, the neat thing about this graph is we don't have to be restricted to being only at one atmosphere like this one. We can do it and have a graph that will account for whatever pressure we're at. So why don't we put pressure then on the y-axis? And obviously we know temperature has an effect on the states of matter as well, so we'll put temperature and we'll do degrees Celsius on the x-axis. We'll do atmospheres. Oh, okay. Okay, awesome. So why don't you draw one in for us? Uh, so why don't we do this? Uh, we don't go all the way to the axis, do we here? Depends where your axis starts. How about that? And how about that? That is super cool. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have some states of matter. We're going to uh, put in some numbers here for a moment, but this represents... I know that generally at really low temperatures, we're going to be dealing with the, the solid state for, for water. I know that generally at really high temperatures, we're going to be dealing with the, the gas state. And we know that at uh, you know uh, sort of normal pressures and normal temperatures, uh, water exists mostly in the liquid state. Now I also know, based on this graph, that at one atmosphere temp uh, atmosphere temperature, that's not a temperature, <laughs> one, one atmosphere pressure, there's phase changes that occur at zero degrees and 100 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and label a number on here. I'm going to make this one atmosphere. This graph, by the way, not to scale, if you eventually see where things are happening. Well, gosh, if then at one atmosphere we change, according to this graph right here, from the solid to the liquid state, I know what temperature that occurs at. Absolutely. So that's our melting temperature. And if we kind of keep going at one atmosphere, keep raising the temperature, we experience another phase change between the liquid and the gas state right here, which I can imagine is at 100 degrees Celsius. That temperature, the temperature at which a liquid boils when the pressure is one atmosphere, is called the normal boiling point. Awesome. 
All right, now, so crossing the line means we have some phase changes. So as we go from solid to liquid, you all know that's melting, or liquid to solid, freezing, liquid to gas, boiling, and gas to liquid, condensing. So there's our, our phase changes. And, and as we talked about before, at an extremely low temperature and a low pressure, I should say, uh, we can actually experience a solid going directly to a gas. Again, that's called sublimation. Is there a name for it, Mrs. May, if I'm going the other way? It is. It's called? Deposition. Deposition, like in a court of law. Exactly. So we've got sublimation and deposition is the opposite of that. So like in your lab, for example, you did not have sublimation happening, but we, you lowered the pressure, so perhaps you were somewhere over here. Hmm. That's so a little extreme. Here I was. <laughs> That's right. Maybe not. Uh, instead of raising or lowering the temperature, we were. Oh gosh, I'm oh, sorry. back in highlighter mode. Changing the pressure. I was changing the pressure going. And so if you look, you could get that phase change to occur, oh, I don't know, 50 or 60 degrees like you did in the lab. If you were at a lower pressure. Absolutely. Now the question might be do we see a change in the freezing temperature? And that one's not so significant. It's the, the, the slope of this center line here where uh, is actually a pretty minimal slope. So the, the temperature does change mm -hmm. eh, a, a little, little bit, bit, but not, not as much as uh, the, the boiling point, for sure. Now, water is a little different than other phase diagrams. If we take a look, I'm going to draw a phase diagram for probably most other substances. Yeah, we can use CO2 as our sort of reference point, but... Uh, but it this could is be probably any, similar to most, most substances. Um, where it's going to have a very similar look, but the difference is going to be the slope. That's a really bad picture. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is going to be the slope of this line. Yeah. It's a little bit different than with water. You could see that with this one. It's a <laughs> with this one, it's a positive slope, but with the water, it was a negative. I always think that that makes a lot more sense that uh, under most circumstances I would imagine raising the pressure uh, so squeezing on the substance basically and having it change from the solid to uh, the or liquid to the solid state that you imagine squeezing things and you would put them together in the solid state water is sort of a weird one that uh, goes the other way so yeah and so you can see that if here if you're a liquid you know you can get it into the solid state by just by increasing just the pressure it. Yeah, water, right. because water floats, we have a slightly different scenario. That's there. right. That actually, yeah, ties into the fact that ice floats on water. The fact that the solid state is actually less dense than the liquid state is one of the reasons why our water one goes like that. Or maybe I, I should say the fact that the diagram looks like that. Is because the density of the solid is less than the density of the liquid. Yeah. Now, if this is carbon dioxide, Mm -hmm. What's unique about carbon dioxide and it is also unique about iod well, not maybe unique, but is something that is maybe unique to you, um, is that carbon dioxide and iodine, which you guys got to see in the, in the last lab, here's general standard pressure. So that means, as we look at this, as we go across and we start heating it up... Oopsie, I missed. Sorry. <laughs> That you're labeling the phase. There we go. Yeah. Notice that you never see the liquid phase. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you guys look at ice and go, oh, well, when would that ever sublime? Which it does, but you don't get to see that very easily. Um, but carbon dioxide, you guys are familiar with this. Solid carbon dioxide is dry ice. You never see that liquefy on a table. You just see it turn right, right into, into a, a gas. gas. And iodine does the does the same thing. It just sublimates or or deposes, I guess, depending on which way you go. <laughs> uh, all right, so Mrs. May has one other very cool uh, phase diagram. You want to just do it down yep. here? Uh, this is for a very cool substance, and I'll let her draw the graph, but uh, this is the, the phase diagram for the element carbon. So the unique thing about carbon, of course, and, and this is not an all-encompassing carbon phase diagram because carbon has actually a lot of forms. Um, for you science-y types, there's like Buckminster Fullerene, Bucky and balls. graphene, and all of these <laughs> things. And we're, we're just going to deal with some of the major forms of carbon. Um, graphite, which is in your pencil, diamond, of course, uh, 
liquid and gas. And notice it doesn't have that same shape as the other ones do because it's got multiple solid phases that exist. And just to give you a sense here, these are approximate temperatures and that's in Kelvin. So this line is around 4,000 Kelvin, this line around 1,000 atmospheres. So as we look at it, one thing I want you to be aware of is that in a phase diagram like this, if you put graphite under extreme pressure, it can turn into diamond. But if you release the pressure, it, it doesn't, doesn't go back, back the yeah. other way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness for De Beers. And so the question people always want to know is, well, then why don't they just make diamonds that way? And the answer is, they do yeah. all the time. <laughs> they don't make pretty diamonds. You wouldn't, guys, you don't want to give these diamonds that they just make in the lab to your girlfriend, you know, as an engagement ring or something. Um, they're pretty ugly and not perfect diamonds, but they're great for industry. Uh, Mrs. May's class, have a little fun tomorrow. Ask her to show you the Life Gem website, and uh, you guys can have a little fun class discussion about that. I have no idea what you're exactly. About. So <laughs> ask her about it tomorrow. Uh, you know, we should talk about one more thing before we uh, before we sign off here, and let's do. Oh, we uh, forgot. <laughs> uh, I totally forgot about this. Uh, there's a really interesting point on the graph, and I, I'm drawing it, drawing your attention to it because I know I'm drawing all over the screen. See that point right there? Uh, that's a really interesting point because if you notice. I, I can encounter the solid, the liquid, and the gas phase all together at this one point. Uh, and literally all three of those states of matter can exist simultaneously in equilibrium. They can all be happy and one isn't trying to necessarily become the other. Uh, it's called the triple point. And that sounds awesome. And you and know what it looks like? Uh, it looks like there's solid, liquid, and gas all together. It looks like a glass of ice water. Yeah, it really does. I mean, that's pretty yeah. much it. Uh, now, the uh, temperature and pressure at which that happens, uh, it's 0 0.01 degrees Celsius. I happen to know <laughs> this. Uh, and 0 0.006 atmospheres. So sort of a strange set of circumstances. But, uh, but at that point, you could have all three of those states of matter existing simultaneously, and there isn't necessarily a phase change going on at that point. It's... Yeah, happy. and just to kind of go back, like when we talked about this kind of graph, we had always said that on the line we have both states of matter. Well, now this line has become this point. So on that line, we have both states of matter. Um, same here, and that's why at this point, we can have all three states of matter existing all at the same time. Sort of, you know, we're not going to lose any of them at that point. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's it. Uh, have fun if you guys have questions. We can talk more tomorrow. Life awesome. gem. Life gem. <laughs> Bye.